I'm also curious about this question. In America, we actually have enough. I really don't understand the lot of jobs and organizations that are only around as superfluous entities. I worked in an advertising agency for some time and while it was a cool job because I always wanted to work in advertising or be in a creative industry, I found it wasn't a necessary industry. While marketing, I guess, is necessary for highlighting products people would potentially want or need to buy, there's so many marketing and advertising agencies. And while the essential function of, of these organizations seem useful at first, we have all experienced firsthand the malignant nature of advertising, not just this industry, but others too. But since we're on the topic, Advertising wields a power to conjure false needs out of thin air. Adverts often appeal to a real need for things like social acceptance, self, uh, respect, self-esteem, and a cultural identity trying to persuade us that these things can be purchased. The craft of most contemporary advertising is to bypass informed judgments about quality and price and to juxtapose the object with an emotion or idea. The aim is to create a symbolic association between a product or a brand and something more ephemeral. Images of popularity, attractiveness, family, harmony, sophistication, good health, or any other of the social values we hold dear. This is not to say that we mindlessly absorb media messages like a drug injection, but it is to suggest that media images of the good life are constantly working upon and exaggerating our desire for material goods. In the 1990s, researchers in the USA estimated that by the age of 18, the average American will have seen around 350,000 advertisements. In 2011, this level of cultural exposure cost the advertising agency or industry our gargantuan global total of $500 billion. The message of advertising's immense landscape is ubiquitous and uniform. It tells us that no matter how much we already have, the only way to secure happiness is to buy more. <laughs> In today's market, we seemingly have the choice of what products as well as what advertisements we consume. If you have a Hulu subscription, you're very aware of what I'm talking about. When the show you're watching stops and pauses, and uh, there's like this screen that asks what ad you like to watch, it seems like you're given a choice as to what to consume. But are you really? As Conrad Lozniak summarizes, the new consensus portrays the realm of consumption as an arena of choice and individual freedom. It focuses on the meaningful nature of consumption. It's symbolic rather than its material use value, and it emphasizes the significance of consumption for the formation, maintenance, and expression of self-identity and lifestyle. Reminding us of this, the philosopher Kate Soper recalls the aftermath of 9-11 and the way in which American consumers were beckoned by the government to shop patriotically in order to exercise their liberty and demonstrate their allegiance to the Western way of life. Soper interpreted this desperate plea for people to stop mourning and start shopping as a remarkable reminder of the dependency of corporate power on people's loyalty to consumerism. Metaphorically, the idea of encirclement conveys the sense in which we in affluent nations live our lives through public, private, institutional, and commercial space and through a temporal arrangement of day-to-day -day activities that has arisen in intimate connection with a market capitalism and that places us in a life world utterly geared for consumption. With this in mind, let us pose the question again. How does capitalism produce in us a need to spend more and more to the detriment of our freedom to work less? Humphrey's idea of encirclement is faithful to Gore's suggestion that most consumer transactions are not produced by the hidden persuasions of advertising but are actually best understood as obligatory or more objectively necessary by capitalism. This explains the widespread consumption of commodities and services whose main draw is their convenience. From ready meals to dishwashers and home cleaning services, a range of needs which people could self-furnish had they the time and energy are now conventionally met through commercial transactions. 
Gore's suggestion that consumption is fueled by the alienation of labor also draws attention to the fact that a certain proportion of people's spending might be explained as an effort to find solace and compensation for misery at work. It has been suggested that luxury services or goods provide consolation for the unmet needs of the spirit or that the frivolity and impulsivity of the shopping experience are enjoyed as a contrast to the discipline of work. The home decked out with consumer goods represents a private realm over which the individual can rule and retreat from work's relations of subordination as solitary sovereign. The explanation for consumer motivations offered here is not the consumer's materialism, simple-mindedness, or narcissistic hunger for distinction, but the gradual reshaping of society's conventions temporal rhythms and built environments in ways which construct commodity intensive lifestyles as the norm central to this process is capitalism's tendency towards commodification activities that were previously excluded from the economic sphere are being progressively pulled into its orbit and the satisfaction of a growing range of needs from social contact to knowledge transportation health fun shelter nourishment safety and self-distinction needs which were previously satisfied with a lower volume of smaller range of commodities is now increasingly reliant on financial transactions in the market it is now abnormal impossible and in some cases even criminal to meet many personal needs without recourse to consumption you work to earn money in order to buy things you need and want what all of this means is that consumers' needs are exaggerated in a variety of ways, certainly in part through the persuasive tactics of media advertising, but also through a range of other impositions to spend money, which are more accurately described as structural rather than cultural in their character. A powerful need to consume increases people's sense of reliance on the income earned through working and also helps to vindicate the devotion of vast proportions of the economy to the production and distribution of disposable goods. In the words of J.K. Galbraith, the constant amplification of consumers' needs under capitalism represents at least one part of the elaborate social camouflage that keeps societies from realizing that a reduction of work is possible. The development of productive technologies offered Western society choice to have more leisure time or to increase the production and consumption of consumer goods. Capitalism took us down the latter path and the utopian dream of ease and leisure for all was buried under a mountain of commodities. If the promise of less work and more time to ourselves looked possible towards the beginning of the 20th century, those who envisioned a less work-centered future overlooked the extent to which the agents of capitalism would force us to accept the dividend of growing productivity in the form of more consumption rather than more leisure time. If developments in productive technologies create a theoretical possibility for a reduction of working hours, the real-life possibilities for a reduction of work continue to be blocked by the principle of constant economic growth and by capitalism's ongoing efforts to press our leisure time into the hands of consumption. To reference our beloved and most recent holiday again, Christmas is not really our holiday to enjoy, take time away from work. Rather, the gifts, the consuming, the efforts in working more to get these items is all designed. As much as we enjoy these holidays for whatever it has been constructed for us to enjoy it as, it is merely a guise for the structural nature of capitalism and our thoughtless servitude to the system. We don't have any leisure time. Just the idea of quote unquote free time, which is technically not really free, and never was ours. It's giving capitalism is the pimp and it seems we are forever the <laughs> ho ho ho's. 
Thank you guys so much for watching this part two of chapter three. I am so sorry I had to make a part two. I was having technical difficulties, but I'm so glad I was able to get this up for you all. Um, and I just wanted to address one of the rants that I <laughs> had recently. Um, I mentioned something about I don't make these videos because I want to gain new subscribers. Um, and I just don't want that to be misconstrued. I am so, so thankful for everyone that watches my videos, everyone that comments, engages, likes, and subscribes to my channel um, I wouldn't be able to really you know figure out what I would want to do next or be motivated to do any other videos if it wasn't for people engaging so I don't want that to be misconstrued at all um, my point was just to say that um, fundamentally I am passionate about making these types of videos because you know the the world um, and yeah I also wanted to just mention that um, I'm making these videos about um, David Frayn's book because I do think that work is so heavily tied to antinatalism and um, you know our whole basis of living and getting along in this or getting around in this life is uh, through the means of work and I just want to understand what that really is about so um, just trying to dissect that chapter by chapter and, and I hope you guys understand why I am um, doing videos on this book because I do think work is very relevant to antinatalism. Um, oh my gosh, there was so many other things that I think I mentioned in the video before it was broken down so messed up the way it is um, where I had to do a part two that I'm doing now. But um, hopefully that's all y'all need to know <laughs> for now. Um, but yeah, um, thank you guys so much again for watching. I so appreciate you guys tuning in. Um, and I will be seeing you guys in the next one. All right, thanks.